<laughs> we are live. Okay, good morning. And let's call the meeting to order. This is a committee meeting of the Government Accountability Committee. And on the agenda is the uh, self introductions, including interest in the committee. So we'll go around the table. I'm Brian Collimore. I represent Rutland County in the Senate. I sit on Senate Agriculture in the morning and Government Operations in the afternoon and currently serve as co chair of this committee. I'm the other co-chair, Maida Townsend, state representative for Chittenden 7-4, which is one of the four districts into which South Burlington is divided. I currently serve on House Appropriations, and previously, when I was first appointed to the Government Accountability Committee, I uh, was a member of House Government Operations. I am Representative Samantha LaFave. I represent Orange County District 1, and I sit on government operations. Good morning, Karen Dolan. I'm representative out of Essex Junction, and I serve on House Corrections and Institutions, and I'm brand new to the committee, so I'm looking forward to learning all about it today. I'm Jessica Brunstead, and I represent Shelburne and St. George and have been on the committee. I think this is my third term of it, um, halfway through. And I was on House Government Operations, and now I'm on House Human Services Committee. So that's how I ended up here to begin with, but really care about this issue and have gone to the National Council of State Legislatures to talk a bit about it as well. Also with us today from the administration, Justin Kenny. I'll let him introduce himself. And from Legislative Council, we have uh, Amarin Aberjali. So you guys can tell us who you are. Sir, uh, yeah, Justin Kenny. So I'm serving as the Interim Chief Performance Officer for the state, taking over for Susan Zeller, who retired, I think, a little over two months ago at this point. Uh, my actual title is Director of Continuous Improvement and Planning. I've actually been working with Sue in the Chief Performance Office for two, two and a half years now. Uh, mostly on the training side and the project side. So very focused on the training and continuous improvement that we've been providing to staff, as well as on results-based accountability and you know, trying to <laughs> improve government in any possible way that we can. Um, so I've been doing most of that work while Sue's been focused on the legislative committees and performance reporting and all that stuff. But I'm, I'm excited to serve in the interim role and then we'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> the actual role. Okay, yeah. thanks Justin. Amarin? Amarin Abergele. I support the government operations committees and generally follow any government operations related legislation wherever it takes me. So. I think we also have two other folks joining us on Zoom. Um, I'm not sure how we can get them on to introduce themselves. All they have to do is unmute themselves and, okay. and they'll be able to do <laughs> Hello, Susanna. Good morning, Susanna. Hi, buenos dias, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Thank oh, you for and, joining uh, us. Thank you. And I guess I forgot to mention, I am um, connected to slash interested in this committee because we care about continuous improvement. And um, part of the work here is developing performance targets, et cetera. Hi, everyone. Drew Restley, I'm the Director of Performance Improvement at the Agency of Human Services, and have worked closely with this committee and former Chief Performance Officer Sue Zeller for many years, um, supporting you all to have um, structured conversations using results-based accountability about your work, and also trying to create some insight into state systems, mostly within the Agency of Human Services, how we actually do our system of accountability work and continuous improvement over time. And Justin is a close colleague, so Justin, happy to see you here. Thank you, Drew. Um, so let's move to uh, the overview of the statute, statutory authority and responsibility and uh, Amarin's going to bring us up to date on that. Certainly. So I have a relatively brief presentation that Mariah is going to uh, put up on the screens, and hopefully people on the phone will also be able to see it. Thank you. So this morning, I'm going to run through the statutory authority for the Government Accountability Committee as well as the uh, tasks that are assigned to you under statute. Uh, 
This will be fairly high level, so hopefully a good introduction for those of you who are new and a refresher for those of you who have been on this study for a number of years. Next slide, please. So first we're going to talk about the government accountability charge under statute. Next slide, please. The Government Accountability Committee is established in Title II in Section 970. The committee shall recommend mechanisms for state government to be more forward-thinking, strategic, and responsive to the long-term needs of Vermonters. Are you able to see that? I'm going to pretty much be reading what's on here, so if you aren't able to see it in the miniature version. Fine. There, so, okay. All right, uh, next slide, please. So there's a number of specific duties under Title II, Section 970A. First, propose areas for the review of statutory mandates for public services that may result in service duplication and to review the alignment of financial and staff resources required to carry out those mandates. Number two, review the legislative process for the creation and elimination of programs and make recommendations for enhancements to the process that support greater long range planning and responsiveness to the needs of Vermonters. Three, recommend strategies and tools that permit all branches of state government to prioritize the investment of federal, state, and local resources in programs that respond to the needs of the citizens of Vermont in a collaborative, cost-effective, and efficient manner. Pursuant to those strategies and tools, functions that are not critical to an agency or department mission may be recommended for combination or elimination, while other functions may be optimized. Next slide, please. Five, determine that data-based program level performance measures that demonstrate program results have been adopted for the programs in each agency and department. Six, determine whether each agency and department is taking action to achieve the population level outcomes set forth in Title III, Section 2311 that are relevant to that agency or department as shown by the manner in which the agencies or department's program level performance measures inform population level indicators. There's a lot in that one, but we'll get into that a bit later. <laughs> uh, seven, ensure that the report set forth in Title III, Section 2311 regarding population level outcomes and indicators and each agency's or department's program level performance measures are transparent and readily accessible to the public via electronic publication. Next slide, please. Eight, assess the effectiveness of population level indicators in measuring progress in achieving population level outcomes and annually review population level indicators in the context of new data development. Nine, approve the addition, amendment, or elimination of population level indicators. And 11, assess whether and how the state of Vermont should provide funds to nonprofit organizations including whether grants to or contracts with nonprofit organizations should require results-based accountability. Next slide. So those are the specific duties that we just ran through. You're going to hear much more about those in depth um, from Drew and uh, from Justin. Justin, Justin, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so now I'm just going to run uh, through other statutory provisions that are just about how the, per, the committee operates. So in section B1, you see the membership of the committee shall be appointed each biennial session of the General Assembly. The committee shall comprise eight members. So, and also the chief performance officer shall serve as a non-voting liaison to the committee. C, the committee shall elect two co-chairs from among its members and shall adopt rules of procedure the co-chairs shall be a House and a Senate member. The committee shall keep minutes of its meetings and maintain a file thereof. A quorum shall consist of five members. Uh, D, during the legislative session, the committee shall meet at the call of the co-chairs. When the General Assembly is not in session, the committee may meet monthly at the call of the co-chairs and may meet more often subject to the approval of the Speaker of the House and the President Tempore of the Senate. Next slide, please. E, for attendance at a meeting when the General Assembly is not in session, legislative members of the committee shall be entitled to compensation for services and reimbursement of expenses as provided under Section 23 of Title II. Uh, the staff services of the Joint Fiscal Office, the Office of Legislative Operations, Office of Legislative Council shall be available to the committee. 
And then G, at least annually by January 15th, the committee shall report its activities together with recommendations, if any, to the General Assembly. The report shall be in brief summary form. So then next slide, please. Uh, just a brief note on results-based accountability. Uh, next slide, please. Looking at how all of these statutory provisions work together, you're looking at, again, Title III, Section 2311. You will have 10 population quality of life outcomes. Those are listed uh, within that statute. So these are the, the population level outcomes that you will see um, are supported by the indicators, which I'm going to talk about next. So the indicators are not in statute. Um, however, the statute does provide a process for this committee to approve those indicators, which are uh, data intended to demonstrate the state's progress in reaching these outcomes. So for example, if you have a population level quality of life outcome, a, uh, Vermonters are healthy. One of the indicators that the committee might look at to see whether Vermonters are healthy are, for example, percentage of adults who smoke cigarettes. And then lastly, you will see that the statute also requires that the chief performance officer annually submit a state outcomes report on these outcomes and the indicators. And that is the end of a very high level overview. Okay, anyone have questions for Amory? Um, again, for the benefit of those of you that are brand new, and unfortunately, not all of our brand new members are here today. Uh, I just want to run through what the outcomes are right now, the population level outcomes. And I'm not going to go through the indicators because that would take substantially more time. Um, and let you know that I don't know whether it was as a result of what we did on January 28th or February 20th, but we did vote as a committee and we have to do it statutorily, by the way, if we're going to change outcomes. We can change indicators at any time we feel we need to, or at the suggestion of anybody um, so inclined. But we, we can't change outcomes unless we put that into law. And we did uh, put a bill together. Actually, it was Senator Collimore and White who put S95 in last year, it's still on the wall in the Senate Government Operations Committee. We did not take action and we started to talk about it and then decided we'd hold off until this group met again. And then it's still active in the sense that this is the second year of a biennium and the, the legislation's already in committee so we could take action on it later. Anyway, um, here are the outcomes as they exist at the moment. Number one, Vermont has a prosperous economy. Number two, Vermonters are healthy. Number three, Vermont's environment is clean and sustainable. Number four, Vermont is a safe, safe and welcoming place to live. And actually that phrase and welcoming is part of the uh, potential change. So let's just say for the moment, Vermont is a safe place to live. Number five, Vermont's families are safe, nurturing, stable, and supported. Outcome six, Vermont's children and young people achieve their potential. Outcome seven, Vermont's elders live with dignity and in settings they prefer. Outcome eight, Vermonters with disabilities live with dignity and in settings they prefer. Outcome nine, Vermont has open, effective, and inclusive government. And outcome 10, Vermont state infrastructure meets the needs of Vermonters, the economy, and the environment. So those are the existing outcomes. And under each of them are several indicators. Sometimes there's three. I think there's, in some cases, as many as seven or eight by which you can take a measure of how well those outcomes are being met. And um, again, we, we can go through them if you like. I don't have them written out, but they're available on the, uh, the dashboard if you want to look. So what S95 proposes to do is to reduce the number of outcomes to nine. 
Um, number s number four would change to say Vermont is a safe and welcoming place to live. Outcome seven would change and become incorporated with outcome eight. So the di distinction between Vermont's elders and Vermonters with disabilities would no longer exist as separate thoughts. Instead, they would be all included in Vermonters live in settings they prefer. And that's the change, or those are the changes. So um, we were proposing to take into uh, account nine uh, outcomes. And so obviously the indicators would, would move under different outcomes as well. Uh, but again, that hasn't been taken up, but I'm pretty sure that Senator White who's a member of this committee and also the chair of the Senate Government Operations Committee will wanna look at that when we reconvene in January, just to sort of set the stage. I should have mentioned at the outset, um, the microphones in this room are very sensitive. So just be aware that even if you sigh heavily, uh, people will probably be able to hear that. Um, papers. We're, we're papers are the other thing when you're moving yeah. the papers. We're live on YouTube and it's also being recorded. And if you haven't done it yet, if you just make sure to either mute or turn off your uh, cellular phones, that would be helpful. So um, any questions on any of that? And I'm just looking at, yes, uh, Representative uh, Dillon. Oh, so with the S95, those changes were voted out of the committee last session, right? The committee proposed those changes to be put into S95. This committee, yes. Yeah. Great. Yep. Yeah, the feeling, and I don't mean to, and certainly uh, Representative Thomas can jump in. I think the the issue with um, what was seven and eight was that we were making a distinction, perhaps unnecessarily, between Vermont elders and Vermont Vermonters with disabilities, thinking that they were separate. When in fact, we wanted to be a little bit more inclusive and just say Vermonters in general uh, should be able to live in settings they prefer. And that was basically the change. Am I remembering? That's exactly correct. And it came from our February 22nd meeting. Okay. So anybody else have anything? No? All right. Well, we've managed to catch up time-wise pretty well. Um, Justin, it's now your um, update that we're gonna look at. And for those of you that haven't had a chance there, well, I'm sure you'll explain. There's a dashboard that's available on the uh, state's website where you can see all of the outcomes and the attendant indicators, and you can look up and see uh, how well we're doing. Um, I'm thinking that there's a green arrow if we're sort of improving, and there's a red arrow going down if we're not, and then maybe one that is kind of neutral. Yep. Um, and I'm not sure how... Um, updated those are in terms of, uh, I know we had an email from somebody that was concerned that some of them haven't been updated since 2018, and here we are in 21. And obviously the pandemic had something to do with all of that. So I'll just turn it over to Justin, who again is uh, the interim uh, mm -hmm. chief performance officer for the state. Excellent. So I've got a couple things on my list. I'll, I'll walk through. We can that start with the great. outcomes report. Yep. So in terms of process, just so you know how this rolls, um, so outcomes report is due at the end of September and September 30th. Uh, we're we're going to start launching the process probably at the beginning of next week. I'll send out a memo to everybody that's responsible for providing their data updates. We'll gather all that data. They'll have a month to get that data to me. And then we'll have to do some massaging of that data and uh, manipulation of the data to get it into the clear impact scorecard that is managed by AHS. And, and Drew can speak to that if you have specific questions on that, but we're using the software that they are to report on all the outcomes and indicators. So there's a whole process behind that, but that's gonna start to kick off now. So I'm very interested in the March 1st memo, as well as the work that Drew and Susana and others were doing around changing some of those indicators and trying to make them more inclusive because that will obviously have some impacts. If there's nothing that's happening this year in terms of those indicators, that's great because I don't have to ask people about their data and figure out if we actually have the data because I'm not sure with many of the things that are being proposed if we can disaggregate. Um, but if we're looking at next year, then that would give a lot more time to actually make sure that we have good quality data. 
and we can get as much of it as possible for the, the ones that the committee is interested in. Because I know that there's a number that have been proposed through the workshops. Mm -hmm. So that's the process for the scorecard. And if you don't have the link to last year's scorecard, I can provide that for anybody that needs that. But there was that question about the outcomes of well-being scorecard, which I believe is a different scorecard than the outcomes report scorecard and the data updates to that. And Drew, maybe perhaps you can respond to that because I had pinged you on that because I think a lot of the data is AHS's data and some of it is 2018, 2019, 2020. And I think the question was, some of these are pretty outdated. Why are they not updated, mm -hmm. right? And the piece related to that was the genuine progress indicator and what's the status of that. So Drew, do you want to talk, if you can, about the, the outcomes of well-being scorecard and those data updates, and then we can hit on genuine progress indicator? Sure. Um, and I did also want to make one note, which I put in the chat. It's a little hard. Obviously, we're still figuring out this kind of hybrid structure. I had raised my hand before when Senator Collinmore was talking about the recommended changes to outcomes that were considered by the Senate Op um, Government Operations Committee during the last session. I just wanted to note that there was extensive discussion had by a small group of this committee that included Susanna and I, and a few members of the committee, as well as um, a representative from the Social Equity Caucus, um, Representative Christie. And our recommendations were that a robust community stakeholder engagement process be leveraged before coming to any conclusions about changes to outcome language and indicators. As Senator Colmore already mentioned, it's only a change to outcome that requires a statutory adjustment. Um, and sort of even more important then that we make sure that those changes are informed by the communities that we are serving and that this agenda is supposed to reflect. Um, so I would love to talk more about that at some point during this meeting or at a future meeting, Senator Collinmore and Representative Townsend, because I believe we have an opportunity that's funded that can be leveraged to that end. Um, but to Justin's point, there is a um, outcomes report that Justin will manage as he just described. And there is an AHS report of all of the AHS data included in that broader report that we also maintain as a public dashboard. And so there's two reports because one of them is AHS focused and it feeds the larger. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to turn my camera on. And so we will continue to maintain a separate dashboard because it allows us to kind of um, organize our own performance dashboards in relation to it. But the the scorecard or the dashboard that includes all agency and departments contributions is the one that Justin will speak to, help compile and present to you. I think, oh, and the data frequency. So some of our data sources are not updated annually. Uh, we have a couple that are updated every two years, for instance, but we still perceive that to be our best and most reliable data source. So we don't always have the what appears to be the most updated data, but it actually is relative to the source. Uh, that being said, we're always interested in revisiting what data sources we are including so that we can be, um, I mean, looking at the most sensitive data that we have available. Um, that being true, it's also possible that there is an indicator or two that are actually outdated in the scorecard. And I was not aware of those, but I'll certainly double check and make sure it's up to date. Uh, prior to Justin's report. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Drew. So in terms of genuine progress indicator, how many of you are familiar with that? It, it might be wise for the recording also if you just... Oh. Okay, yeah, personally, I don't know much about it because I haven't been involved in any of the work, but I do know that um, there was an effort that I think started in 2013, 2014 to look at a, a different indicator than uh, GDP, gross domestic product, or GSP, gross state product. And so uh, the Gund Institute at UVM worked with Kenneth Jones and the Agency of Commerce Community Development and a number of other folks to basically create a calculation that comes out with this genuine progress indicator that is somewhat more... Uh, Gosh, I'm trying to think about the right word to use here. It, it's just a different way to look at the growth and success of Vermont as a state. 
right? Not just on product, but it's also looking at social factors and environment, a number of other things. So there's a whole calculation that's involved and a lot of data that gets gathered to develop this report. The last one was done in 2018. It's actually longer than this. This is just a table of contents. Um, and that was funded through an appropriation, I believe through the agency of administration to the Gund Institute to do that work. Two reports were done, one in 2018 and one in 2015. So the reports generally get done every three years. The gentleman who was really the leader of this, Eric Zensi, passed away. And so this hasn't been picked back up since 2018. I talked to Kenneth Jones about it, and he said that it would probably take about 15 to 20 hours of time to recalculate the GPI. Mm -hmm. But more than likely, that would not include the very extensive report that has been done in the past, which I think is really the meat of it. So when I think about this as an index for making policy decisions, because I think that the email was really about why don't we use that for policy decisions, right? So you're looking at data from three years ago for one, but also it's an index. And in terms of making policy determinations or setting strategies, you always have to go to the deeper level data anyway to understand what are the things that are changing. So with an index, obviously all of those data points are being mashed together. And that's a calculation behind it. So the GPI could actually stay stationary, whereas one element within the GPI is going up and others going down. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't see that just by looking at the GPI, right? You always have to look at the underlying data. So in terms of a, an index that's a nice thing to do and to look at and think about and see as trends over time, I think it's great as a, as a corollary to the gross domestic product. But in terms of making policy decisions, I, I would think it would be hard to do that without then getting into the granular level data, which makes that up, which is our performance measure data and some of our indicator data related to the scorecard anyway. So at this point, I don't believe there's any funding to redo the report. There could be, I could ask, committee was interested, I could ask Ken to redo the calculations on that and have that conversation with him about whether or not he has the time to do that. Um, but again, that report of like the analysis of what is going on in the past three years with that, I'm not sure what that would look like and whether there's anyone that would be able to do that at this point in time without some sort of funding. I just don't know. Questions for Justin? Yes. Yeah, so what, is, what is the opportunity that we are missing by not getting an updated version of that report. I'm trying to kind of synthesize that piece of it because you're saying that the dashboard of the outcomes report provides a number of the data points. Um, so what are, what are we missing by not getting that updated? Yeah, that I'm not sure about. Okay. I mean, having not been involved and having not used the GPI before, I'm just, I'm not sure what we gain by having it and what is lost by not having it. I think it'd be helpful to understand if any legislative committee in the past has used that to make any sort of recommendations or taken any actions or not. That I don't know, right? Okay. If, if so, then, and it's helpful, then yeah, let's recalculate it and figure out how. But if it's, if it doesn't, if it's not going to be used to really drive a decision-making process, I think the question is, do we need to recalculate it just for the sake of having another three years of data? Or does it make sense to look at potentially some of the indicators that we have currently and some of the data points that were in the report, if there's any gaps, whether it makes sense to add some of those indicators. So we at least get that view if we don't have it right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, Samantha. Did they give an estimate of how much it was gonna cost? What they're looking for? I don't have that, but I can get it. I, I probably have to talk to the Gund Institute to see. That would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Can I ask the follow-up? Mm -hmm. um, so with so I think asking you know what committees use it is a helpful question and I guess that again I'm starting brand new from this is with the dashboard or the this report that we're talking about the outcomes and the indicators how extensive is that used in committees or like what is what is the baseline for that that would be helpful to know of this something that this is the key product that we're working on as a committee how it then shared, used, what is the vision of it? Yep. Or is that our job to figure out? <laughs> well, I, I, probably some of yours, but I'm sure Drew's coming on yeah. the screen now okay. about how it's used. Because I know AHS uses it extensively. Yeah, we do. yeah. I was going to say, in our committee, we, we always have a presentation by Drew each year of how, where are things going, what direction. 
Okay. And it always takes off into, but why aren't we collecting this? Why <laughs> aren't we collecting that? So you can imagine, but I'll let Drew speak. <laughs> I will jump in because I, I feel like this is my favorite conversation to have. And Justin was probably feeling my telepathic energy waves. <laughs> Um, I, I think that there's incredible opportunity from this, from the heart of this committee in the state house to really imagine what it looks like, um, to have data informed policy conversations. Yes. In committee, but even more broadly to really organize around a data informed agenda. Um, I think that that is happening and I'm sure all of you can reflect on your own committee experiences and think about when data is really helping set the foundation for the conversation. But I think it's even more powerful what we've created as a foundation with Act 186, which is the opportunity to think about, um, well, I already said, like to think about a comprehensive agenda that really crosses um, all areas of jurisdiction and allows for like a higher level conversation yeah. about the silos that take place within agencies and departments and within legislative committees. And so to that end, the Government Accountability Committee has sponsored workshops in the past for all legislators to come together and really ask critical questions about how data is monitored over time in the chambers and, um, and what, what kind of capacities, skill sets, and time we're really looking for in committee rooms to have that discussion. So um, I think this committee in that way really can work as like a little engine that stays focused on the processes of accountability that take place in the building. And then I also know that it's very helpful to use the agenda, to use the Act 186 dashboard as just a jumping off place to invite subject matter experts in to committees or to this committee to have broader conversations about what's happening behind the trend lines, what we're seeing and starting conversations about policy from that place before jumping into the strategy that's being outlined in the policy proposal. So um, that was probably a, maybe too broad of an answer, but I guess my bottom line is I think there's lots of room for all of you to define what could be really effective strategies to help your colleagues across the state house use this report more effectively. Susanna and I spend a lot of time outside the specific context of Act 186, but related to it, thinking about how um, communities, which could be a county or it could be a catchment area of some of our major service systems, or it could just be a group of committed community members um, interested in improving well-being in their area, how they can access data that helps them have collaborative conversations and make collective impact. Act 186, the report and the dashboard are all statewide indicators. So we have an understanding of how Vermont is doing, but we don't necessarily have an understanding of how different regions are doing in relation to one another. Um, AHS does support um, kind of like a programmatic effort that we call the community profiles that does disaggregate the data in Act 186 plus other indicators down into a couple different geographies, hospital service area, county and AHS districts. So it's only one piece of the whole puzzle, but I think it's an example of how we can try to invest in and sustain those types of efforts over time, which, is, which allows your work to be more sensitive. Um, and, and to a point raised earlier, I think by Justin, it allows us the opportunity to really take a, um, an equity lens and think really critically about the story that data is telling us about different areas of the state and different people's experience in the state. Can I just sure. add to that a little bit? I um, One of the things for new members that I think is helpful to think about in your committee is that for years, when I first started, the biggest thing we paid attention to was the fiscal note. We all wanted a fiscal note all the time, right? How does How is this impacted dollar and cents? And what we tried to do as a committee was change that to start looking at what about a performance note? Shouldn't we have a performance note? How are we doing? Are we performing in this area? And if we are, why? And if we aren't, why not? And that is how, for me, that my first year here in, on this 
committee, we talked about that a lot. And I think that our communities are clamoring for that. They want to know, okay, so you just passed this big, huge childcare bill. Is it performing? When will you be able to tell us? And so that's the kind of that sort of puts it all together for me. It helps me. I, I'm not a big RBA. I don't understand all, some of those things. I didn't do a bunch of workshops on all that. I wasn't here then. But for me, the reason I love this committee is that work has to keep pushing forward. And we, um, we continue, I continue to try and make our House Human Services Committee do that. Think about that. And I think that that's happening on more committees now than it was. Representative Tom. If I could just add in, uh, Representative Brumstead needs to be uh, applauded, really, because she's uh, nonstop in terms of helping people always come back to focus on the, the performance com component. And bills coming out of uh, the House Human Services Committee have had uh, folded right into the bill, the need for X, Y, and Z data to be brought forward in a certain way, in a certain time frame, to show, so what's it all about? You know, the, the verbiage, the narrative of the larger bill. A very important piece to, to have and the not, performance built It's right not in. as simple as it seems because Drew brings reality to the discussion for us every time. And that is, okay, you want to collect that data. Do you have any idea what that will cost to collect that data? And that is, that's the hard part of this discussion. It's um, really easy for us to talk about what kind of indicators we want to measure, but how do we get them? How difficult is it to access them? And how much does it cost to access this, to get that information? But we should want to do it because if we're not spending the money on that, we may be spending the money on policy that isn't working. If, yes. if I could relate it to the data, the results-based accountability concept, when the various components of state government come before House appropriations, as one example, I can't speak necessarily as to what transpires in other committees, but in House appropriations, part of each department and agency's presentation to us always has um, a results-based accountability component to it to um, underscore what progress has been made or here's why we need this particular financial support because we're sagging here, that sort of thing. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Uh, so this is very helpful. And so for me, I never knew that the dashboard existed or anything, and it seems like it is a treasure of data and information and like fantastic that we're looking to make sure that has a more um, of an equity lens. How much do you think the average legislature is aware of it? Is there a regular um, like session that we lead that with legislators like, hey, look at this resource, go to it. Like, is there a training or should we just be spreading it word of mouth? Or Go ahead, jump right in. Well, Pre-pandemic, check, check, check. Okay. Um, this and is again, a new world. I don't know, a lot of work came from Representative Brumstead and yeah. pressing forward with this along with Representative uh, Kornheiser right. from Brattleboro uh, to uh, fierce um, leaders on, on this matter. And we had trainings, we had little pieces of paper taken around to every single member, things up on the wall to help people remember um, messages framed in a particular way to potential witnesses so that they would, when they came before committee X, Y, or Z, provide what they had to provide by way of information in a, in a particular framework. But then the pandemic came. So there's been, I would say, zero yeah. uh, for the last 15 plus months because yeah. we had just haven't had the capacity. Well, I would be happy to be back on, I don't know where things are at with it, but I feel like this is a real resource and for us to do that. And because now we're getting ready to hit the ground running with things like let's be informed, let's be data driven. Um, and it's gonna 
and have people be invested in the process as we're trying to make this even more robust. So one of the things though that you are absolutely right on is that I'm not sure how many people know about the dashboard and we've always focused our trainings on, make sure you're asking these hard questions in committee of those folks who are testifying so that they're thinking in this direction too. And you'll notice um, when you read the list, or one, someone read the list, I'm not sure who, which one, which list, but there was a number 11 about not-for-profits and making sure they have yeah. the funds to be able to do this work. And I'd forgotten that that existed, yeah. actually. It's a really good thing for us to look at now with ARPA dollars, but, um, but I... I think we always focus on the future in this building and and I'm not saying we need to focus on the past, but we need to look at the past in order to focus on the future. And so maybe a good workshop, this, you bring this up, is helping people read the dashboard and having meetings where we see in front of us and know how to get to it and know what it can tell us about the work we're doing in each of our committees. And I know that Drew works hard to help us in human services, but is that happening in transportation? Is that happening in corrections? Is that, you know, so that you making sure that the um, those folks who know who work hard on the dashboard and that you're going to be saying, mm -hmm. hey, give us your numbers so we can update that dashboard. It's a perfect time to also say, and how would you like to go to such and such committee, present that material and show people how to access it? you know, maybe we can sponsor that. <laughs> yeah, it might be nice to do it right. I mean, the report's going to be due on September 30th, sometime shortly after that, to get the word out on the report. Because usually it just gets submitted, and then I don't know what happens after that. But Yeah, I mean, submitted. And maybe I'm just somebody who really likes this kind of stuff, but I'm guessing there are probably a lot of other legislators that would be oh. interested, but you yeah. just see a dashboard, and you're kind of like, what do I do with this? How do I but if you have... Uh, training something that is guiding you through it. You're like, oh, I can have some takeaways. But no, I had two other things sure. related to this conversation. So one was on the data and the data collection. So just as an example, it does take a lot of time and resources to gather data and to report on it. So I've been the lead on the federal reporting to the U.S. Treasury on the Coronavirus Relief Fund, Emergency Rental Assistance Program, Local Fiscal Recovery. And that's probably 40 to 50% of my time as a full FDE is spent doing those reports, gathering that data and making sure that it's quality and checking for errors. Just, just federal reporting. It's a lot of work, tremendous amount. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it takes me that much time to do this. And that's just those few things, not all the other indicators that are involved. So there's that. And then I also wanted to say that the other initiative that we have is the programmatic and performance measure budgeting initiative. So instructions for the budget are going to be coming out uh, hopefully soon. And we're going to include in that the requirement that a number of new programs get added. So last year, I think we had 131 programs that were reporting performance measures, and that number is going to increase this year with the new budget instructions. So we're moving more and more towards having the majority of our governmental programs reporting performance measures. Mm -hmm. Whether they're good or not, that still needs to be worked on because a lot of them could be improved. But the idea is like, let's make sure that people are actually reporting the performance so that when you're thinking about programs or initiatives, you have some data right there. And uh, I think in the past, those performance measures have been presented along with the budget when everyone goes to testify on the particular things that we're trying to fund. So that's going to be happening again this year, more programs, which I'm very excited about, continually pushing that forward. It might be helpful, um, since this committee deals so much with data, for either Drew or Justin or Representative Townsend, if you can, because I, I can't remember all the little things that become important when you look at data. How do we determine whether it's useful or not? There are different measures that we, uh, in other words, if you're only gonna ask three people, uh, you know, the universe for that sort of thing is, is too small to make any difference really. So what are the, some of the other things that I'm trying to recall? There were some great videos, right? When we yeah. at that workshop yeah. that showed how you compare data. Right. Um, Drew, can you help out at all on that? I'm just, I'm trying to remember what constitutes good data. It has to sort of pass a few tests. 
Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry, my internet cut me out. So I, I caught your question, Senator Collimore, but I didn't really catch the context. Um, when you're selecting indicators for the report, there's a certain criteria that you would use to try to understand um, it in relation to other indicators and what might be the priority. And those are communication power, proxy power, yeah. and data power. And communication yeah. power really just speaks to Will your constituents understand what it's referring to without having to have a lot of subject matter expertise behind it? Is it a technical um, piece of information that you're trying to communicate through data? And if so, what's the best way to communicate or frame that indicator? Um, is there an indicator that's not as technical that speaks to the same uh, issue? And can you use that one instead? Proxy power is the idea that there are some indicators that will quote unquote pull others with them or that there's something there's some metaphor about the data herd that's hard for me to remember but the point is that some indicators are really um are really referencing the heart of an issue and so if you can measure that one and you can see it improving it is likely that other indicators will improve with it or that if you see one indicator that is um, uh, one indicator that's indicating a challenge, it may be the case that other indicators will indicate the same challenge. So it's you know what's an indicator that um, truly indicates some phenomenon, um, and then there is data power, which is you know is the data reliably, is the data reliable, is it um, qu high quality. Is it reported frequently enough to our earlier discussion that you can actually use it to monitor change over time and in relation to different um, strategies that are being implemented? So those are the three criteria. And we have a, a training that we offer, which is Continuous Improvement 103, Problem Solving with Data, where we get a little more granular on that. And we talk about the difference between averages and medians and how averages can really be thrown off. And you're gonna be careful when you're using how averages and data. We talk about representative data sets to your, to your point. You know, if you have three people out of 3,000, that's not enough to be representative of that particular population. So it's probably not a good data source. So we could combine those high level aspects, the communication, proxy, and data power with the more granular level. Here's how to look at, at data and what to watch out for together into a training if you wanted something like that. Susanna also has her hand up just so you know. Oh, okay. Susanna? Susanna? Thank you. I just wanted to add to that. Um, and this is something that is hard, especially for um, data folks and, and those of us who are really important from an equity perspective that we keep in mind that it's, it's extremely important to be data driven and that sometimes data will misdirect us into thinking that we've addressed a problem when we haven't or vice versa into thinking there is no problem when there is. And one of the examples that I use often when I talk about this is um, early on in my tenure in this role, I had a conversation with uh, some folks at one of our agencies, I believe, at, I think it was AHS, uh, one of the departments there. And and the people I was talking to said, you know, we uh, every year where we get certain title funds from the federal government. And because of that, we're required to give them a yearly summary on our workforce to ensure that our workforce of this specific department is reflective of the statewide population. And we know the statewide population of Vermont. Um, this particular department had professions in it that tend to skew more towards women identified people. Um, and then on top of it, it only takes a handful of Black, Latino, Asian, and Indigenous people to meet statewide population um, proportions. So what ends up happening every year is this department has to send a report to the federal government saying, we're underrepresented with white men, and this is all the outreach we're going to do to be more inclusive of white men in our department because we're so underrepresented. And that's one way in which our data technically show us a disparity, but that's not really reflective of disparities that we know exist in our state and in our society. Um, it was a long example, I'm talking a lot, but I just wanted to say that um, I think I agree with what Justin and Drew have said. It's really important to look at our data and also to look at what it's not showing us. Um, the difference between an average and a median, the difference between um, a, a representative sample size and one that's not representative. And then 
sometimes the absence of certain data points itself is a data point. So I just wanted to add that in, thank you. And thank you, Susanna. That's a great example. And it brings to mind a couple of others as well, but your point is salient. Um, and I think that's why when we're having conversations about how GAC can support some of the other committees, it's important to remember that, and we did, I think Representative Townsend brought this up from our workshop. There are lots of ways to invite information and perspective that don't require quantitative data. And so I think it's important for us to just remember that quantitative data is one tool to help us understand conditions in Vermont, but it's not effective alone. Um, and additionally, and this is our this is our motivation behind robust stakeholder engagement around the future of Act 186, the future of community profiles and other dashboards, is that if we're not measuring disparities according to like different life circumstances and demographics across the state, we're not gonna understand the whole picture. So it's not enough, you know, to, to disaggregate geographically, we need to disaggregate by race and we need to disaggregate by gender. Beyond disaggregation, we need to understand what our questions are enough that we can look for the most sensitive information to help us understand them around um, equitable outcomes in Vermont. Okay. Any questions? I, yeah. I, I had a quick question for Justin. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that you folks do trainings around it. With whom are those trainings done? For state employees. Yep. Uh, in, in terms of departments, uh, gathered it by department or? Uh, it's a mix. Yeah, so they're open to any state employee that wants to take them. I see. It's, so it's not, it, it's a voluntary sort of. Yep. At this point, we've had through continuous improvement 103. So there's 101, 102, 103. It's all focused on problem solving. 103 being focused on data with problem solving. I think at this point, we've had over a thousand, maybe 1,500 individuals have taken that. So pretty, pretty sizable out of our 8,000, 9,000 member workforce. Yep. And then there's further levels of training. We have 14 different trainings that we provide, uh, but there's lower levels. We've had quite a few people that have taken those. And that's just to spread the awareness like we're doing now about data and the importance of data and how to be better problem solvers uh, on day-to-day -day operations, right? Not, not talking about big projects that we often undertake, but just how do I, within the next five seconds, improve something that I'm doing? And how do I use data to help drive that decision? I can legislators take those? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We, have we to... do them through teams. You, anybody yeah. wants to take them? Happy to help you. Teams. Oh. I'm, a, I'm a big teams user. <laughs> That's yeah. the other one from the Zoom. One Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah. On Zoom. Yeah. You'll probably find less of an appetite for uh, lots of Zoom and Teams thing this year. Yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of people just want to get back in the building. But. It, um, uh, Senator Calmer, if we could somehow admit, perhaps Amarin's making a note, or has made a note, that the whole matter of training with regard to the dashboard, et cetera, et cetera, in other words, the uh, a bullet about this conversation, which we've just had, that we don't miss that because that's going to take further training and discuss, not training, excuse me, further discussion uh, and, and planning for it to come to any kind of fruition as opposed to just being a nice conversation here. Mm -hmm. And that was about in the fall? That was one suggestion was in concert with the uh, um, the outcomes report coming out. Or it could be the first week in January. We Goodness, can talk this about is, that. Yeah, we, we need to talk. Because this is the beginning of August. September 30th is going yeah. to be here before we know it. Mm -hmm. so we've, we've experienced once crashing our way through a real time crunch and trying to accomplish a task. <laughs> I don't think any of us relishes mm -hmm. that kind of approach, again, if it can be avoided. So I'm still trying to get a sense of, both on the state level, how many state agencies actually go to the uh, dashboard and use it, if you know, and how many committees in our legislative process, and I can only speak about two of them. Uh, I, I don't think Senate Ag, we've ever <laughs> talked about it. Certainly, I don't remember ever looking at the dashboard. We have in Senate government operations on, on occasion, I will say that. 
Um, Jeanette White, who's the chair there, is also a member of this committee and is a strong um, advocate. We had those little postcards that mm -hmm. we had made up. That, yeah. You know, yeah. what are we doing? Who's better off because we're doing, I can't remember the three questions, but, um, and for a while it was sort of like we stuck on topic and and, we, and then just like everything else in life, it just sort of slowly mm -hmm. goes away. And then you realize it's been months since we talked about it. I don't recall any bill, it's just one man here, but I don't recall any bill in the last year having any sort of performance measure attached to it that came out of the center. I just I, well, the child care bill came out. One seventy four. Okay, yeah, that was an H bill, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah, that's true. Not to, that's not to be yes. parochial, but but we sent it to you. Yes, you did, and it did pass. And you didn't remove the performance measure. It yeah, it did. <laughs> it didn't no, you didn't. Oh. So anyway, um, because it seems like there's a lot of work being done, and then it sort of like in a library, it gets put on the shelf with a whole bunch of other books and nobody just collects dust and nobody ever looks at it again. Well, now maybe perhaps, that may be unfair. That, that perhaps underscores the need to, now that we're going, coming back to something resembling normal, mm -hmm. to do some planning around training again yeah. and reach out and reminding folks, well, for, 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 the, um, for the folks who are going into their second year, uh, in the legislature, they may be totally, um, totally in the dark about any of this. You know? Well, yeah, uh, even procedural stuff, like you know, on our side, what to say on the floor, what not to say, how to how to stand up, get re all that kind of stuff. You haven't had to do that because we, we weren't in session in person. So I, I know there'll be a lot of new things that. You should have sort of been exposed to a year ago, but because of what happened, you couldn't be. So at our next meeting, we need to we need to have as a major item, it would seem, developing a an overall training, training. timeline yeah. and what's going to cover and that sort of thing. So, Amron, if you can sort of take notes in terms of steps going forward, that sort of thing about what what we're kind of saying might be important for, because obviously we, we have to meet again anyway to. Mm -hmm put the report together that's due January 15. Um, whether we'll only meet once or more, I don't know. Well, it, based on today, it's, it's really hard to get the eight people together, so I don't know. <laughs> and I know that pension task force is, they're gonna go all the way through the fall. Right. Um, I happen to sit on judicial nominating and there's already six days in September that are reserved. And uh, so anyway. And once we're back in session, it is, Oh, it's almost Next impossible. To, impossible. That's where yeah. we ran into difficulties. Yeah. But, but Drew's had her hand up there. Oh, I think. Mm -hmm. Isn't yes. that? And what's it? I can't tell if it's a hand or if she's just happy to be with us. High five. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I wanted to jump in and just say that I think it is. I have the same desire for people to use the dashboard. Um, and know that it's there and reference it. I will say that I think we should keep our expectations aligned with the actual value of the tool. You know, it, it's annually updated. Not all the data is always, you know, 2021. And I think many committees find ways of having data informed conversations now, even if they're not drawing from the dashboard. So I think I just wanted us to make sure that we understand the dashboard as a tool that serves a certain purpose, but it doesn't if we're not, if every committee isn't using the dashboard, it doesn't mean that there's not meaningful questions about data being asked. It doesn't mean that there's not performance measures or indicators being referenced. It may be that some of the most useful and, inf and interesting information to a committee is not reported in the dashboard because it didn't roll up to what felt most holistically important. And so I think we just need to keep the dashboard in context of our greater efforts. And to that end, I'll make sure that I reshare, especially with all the new members on this committee, um, all of the handouts and really kind of practical tools that we created in the workshop we did in 2019. Um, so I'll make sure that I, I have that sent out. And Justin, I'll make sure you see it because you weren't involved there. And any new training that we do create Scheduling in January has always been the biggest challenge to our wanting to do this, but um, 
if we can secure a date and and a room and possibility of people coming, I know Justin and I can put our heads together and leverage leverage some of the work that's already happened. And Drew, if you could send, have that sent to all members, not not only the new members to GAC, please. Can't yeah, hurt. I'll add to that. So there is there is a lot of data that's not in the dashboard. So AHS, I think you're the only ones that are using Clear Impact, right, Drew? No other agency is, and it's just Correct. that we do the outcomes report and Clear Impact. But uh, the other agencies have their own data, like uh, AOT SV Transparency, which is, they're using Power BI. A lot of the states using Power BI to visualize their data, which is in the Microsoft suite. Uh, so it's just to say, there's a lot of data out there. I think the hardest thing is getting it into one place, which mm -hmm. scorecard does that well for AHS and for the outcomes, but in terms of other data sets, yeah. it's not quite there yet. So what types of data, I'm just trying to think, would, trans would the transportation agent, like how old the road is and the bridge? The infrastructure, culverts, bridges, yep. yep. Okay. So they have like fatalities, a, all of that. And don't they have like a long waiting list of each thing that's gonna be done and all of that? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They've, been, right? they've been working very hard to okay. get more data out there and gather it. That's why I like your um, idea of, tying a training with you know here's the scorecard here's a tool of how you collect data but then how do you look at data whether it's on the scorecard or whatever tool you are using in your work or your committee how can you be um kind of reflective and curious with it so i think those two things are key so it's not saying you have to use the scorecard but if you're just hearing about data looking at it how can you have a critical lens one of the things that um, that Drew brought to our training, which maybe she can send, is um, was an amazing video like that. This woman oh, who got up and started, she was almost like a comic act. It was really interesting to see what we accept as good data. And then she started explaining the background of it. And it was like, oh, wow, yeah, we totally missed that. You know, and, I do remember that. and how easy it is to exploit data. Mm -hmm. And we have to be good. We have to ask the right questions in order to get at that. And you see people, even in committees, sometimes by accident, you ask a question and they, they sort of fall apart because they're not sure about, and that tells you a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's not that they meant it to be mis- you know, they weren't trying to, it was just they were listening to that data too, you know? So we just have to know how to ask those questions. Yeah. And the more we talk about that particular training, it, it, I think it's helpful to keep in mind that training took place over at the historical society right. next door. We, we uh, don't need to meet here or in a, what you normally think of as legislative space. And that, that space worked great. Yeah. That sort of folds into the next agenda item. But before we do that, can I do a parenthetical element here? Can you sure. through on the email? Parentheses are always welcome. Yes. The, the co-chairs of this committee had a question that we didn't have the answer to before we oh, yeah. um, kicked off the meeting, which was if, the, if there were members uh, of the committee participating via Zoom and we took any votes, could they vote and have it be legitimate? Since, because this is new territory that we're in. Here, here is the answer. And actually, um, Michael O'Grady sent the question to the clerk of the house. Since it was a legislative committee question, we should have sent it to uh, the clerk first. Uh, but in any case, here's the answer. Remote authority for joint committees expired July 15th. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as a joint committee, GAC must have an in-person quorum present to vote to take any actions, and only those members present in person can vote. Mm -hmm. So now we know for the record wow. okay, about the, the uh, participation via Zoom for members. So that's covered now. So what are we moving to? Um, oh, Act 166, yes. So Act 166 passed um, at the very tail end of the 2020 session, meaning at the tail end of September 
of 2020. That session was the one which started in January, picked up again in April, May, somewhere in there, and it, it went off for a while at the end of June, then came together again in August, and finally got finished at the end of September. It, uh, the bill that became Act 166 was one of the very last bills through, and uh, it's it has in it um, specific mandates to this committee. And let me just read from one portion of that statute. It's in section 18, actually, of Act 166, section 18, um, which amended uh, Title III, section 2311, as it relates to the state's outcomes and indicators. Vermont's population level quality of life outcomes are intended to reflect the well being of all Vermonters. Key words there, the well being of all Vermonters and indicators reported to measure the extent to which outcomes are achieved are intended to represent the experience of all Vermonters. That's the key, the experience of all Vermonters, including and especially Vermonters who are members of marginalized groups. Okay, including and especially Vermonters who are members of marginalized groups. And <clears throat> we were tasked with, we were further tasked with um, being directed by the General Assembly to consult with the Executive Director of Racial Equity, that's Susanna, um, the Social Equity Caucus, most of us think of uh, Rep. Christie as a, a driving force there, and the chief performance officer at the time it was Sue Zeller and now Justin as our interim. Uh, we we uh, were directed to consult with those parties and to accept recommendations from other relevant entities in order to approve by March 1, 2021, population level indicators demonstrating the quality of life for Vermonters who uh, are, um, well, what it said at the time was BIPOC, okay? Uh, Black, Indigenous, or people my, of color. thank you, people of color. My brain just froze on me, I apologize. Um, as those indicators relate to the existing state outcomes, Currently, there are no indicators that specifically demonstrate the quality of life for Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, Vermonters. So that was the end of September of 2020. And what we did, we, we, had, um, we had a lot of planning that went on. We also had a meeting in, it was either November the 5th or December the 5th. Uh, but in any case, we, we met whichever month it was on the 5th. It shows in our, you know, in the um, web page on online. Um, that's when, for all intents and purposes, we met to deal with our uh, annual report, which was due by January the 15th. But we also uh, were sure at that point in time to, um, to validate a small working group. I always have thought of Drew and Representative Kornheiser as key players in driving forward the work of that small group on behalf of the full Government Accountability Committee. Um, with regard to following through on the mandate of Act 166, how we were going to do that. So it ultimately played out to, on January 28th, we held a public hearing. There were press releases sent out. It was posted on the legislative website that the hearing would be held and how one could access it. Um, we did receive uh, some criticism that it was sent out in English only 
and not in other languages, the, the press release. Um, but we didn't have the capacity for, for, for taking care of the, the translations at that point in time. Uh, we didn't have the capacity, at least we believed we did not have the capacity in terms of human, uh, human contacts to do it, much less the time frame within which to accomplish it. Because um, remember, we were back in session again by, by then. And uh, it was really tough, you know? You gotta remember, we weren't in person. We, everything was via uh, the, t the technology and the, the pandemic was, was taking its toll in various ways. It's not an excuse, it's simply an explanation of why we might not have been at our most efficient. You know, we were doing the best we could. So we, we had the public hearing and there was outreach done through the Social Equity Caucus and um, other um, outreach um, efforts through folks that we believed had outreach into um, marginalized communities and could help spread the word. When all was said and done on the evening of January 28th, we had it scheduled from six to eight. Well, there was literally a handful of people who, who gave testimony, literally a handful. And, and they gave great information to us, but it was only a handful. And so we didn't end up even going a full two hours. That was followed up. And through all this, the small work group with um, Representative Kornheiser and Drew were working like mad. Um, we followed that up with um, a, uh, a work session on February, the 20, uh, on February the 20th. Keeping in mind, we had from Act 126, this deadline of um, March 1st hanging over our heads. So we, we had a, uh, a work session for the day of the 20th. Again, we did our best to do outreach through the Social Equity Caucus and that sort of thing, invitations sent to individuals that we thought were key um, reach out type folks to, to help spread the word. Um, we had more than a handful of people at the work session, but it, it wasn't a huge number. Um, and uh, in, in our breakout groups, we had folks, there were about 20 people all told, not counting back members participating. We had folks looking at basically two issues through the uh, work session. What would it look or feel like if a particular outcome statement were true for all people in Vermont? And then also what indicators would be useful to review over time to help us understand if we're making progress toward that outcome. And then we had um, reporting out from each of the, the breakout groups on those questions. Then Drew got the, the uh, responsibility and the, the uh, job of gathering all of this. So, and she's gonna walk us through the uh, input that was received from the hearing and that work session. Um, before I turn this over to Drew, we then had another GAC meeting February 22nd the um, days after the, the work session, GAC met again because we had March 1 hanging over our heads. To, we met then to review and theoretically approve recommendations regarding the indicators based on what we'd heard um, in, the, in the public hearing and during the work session. And we also dealt with uh, the request which Senator Collimore spoke about with regard to a draft bill to, to address the outcomes issue, because remember that outcomes can be um, modified only via legislation, whereas we can deal with the indicators ourselves. 
and uh, cost questions came up in that meeting of GAC on the 22nd, specifically, um, what would it cost and what would it take to get further input? More people from various backgrounds, what would it cost and what would it take to get further input? Um, and I was tasked with uh, checking in with the Joint Fiscal Office as to whether or not there might be money found toward um, better dissemination of information about, you know, we're looking for your experiences. Uh, tell us, tell us what we need to hear. Tell us, make us smarter about these, these matters. Um, and um, in different languages, how many different languages, which different languages, all of that. So I did reach out to JFO and um, there was, and I would, have to guess still is some money available if we determined um, more exactly what it is we want to apply the money to, how much, okay? It could come out of the legislative branch component of, this, of, the, of the budget. Um, there were concerns raised about our process and the input received um, up until that point, which I'll address after Drew walks us through what we do here. Um, I can overview for you the. Drew actually had to leave for another meeting. Oh, dear. She did send it via email, so I did forward her comments to you. Oh, okay. To all of us, yes? Yeah. Um, I sent it to, um, she sent it to myself and Senator Collimore. Um, but you have your iPad out, so I forwarded it to you. Okay. To be able to get to. Okay. I can forward it to the group as well if you would like. Oh, there we go. I see. It, it, why not send it to the whole group? Uh, please. Right. Well, it won't help me, but <laughs> I, oh, here. my phone, I only talk oh, and text on. Everybody's got. No, I don't have my note either. We, That's all right. Uh, wait, anybody has it long? Doesn't appear to be. It seems pretty, this is, no, nope, it's a short little thing. <laughs> it's a couple of paragraphs. Yep, I can um, share my email up on the Oh, screen. on the screen, there we go. That, anybody watching this, please understand, this is the first time we've been dealing with this, this approach. Hybrid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> perhaps, well, perhaps while that's coming, so I just share what the issues were that sure. were brought up, the concerns about what we've done. Um, in conversations with JFO, in the person of Stephen Klein, um, asked, started asking me specific questions so as to assess, so how much money do you want me, et cetera. And I said, well, I don't have the answers to those questions. So I entered into a conversation with Representative Christie um, he having spoken with some other folks, as I understand it, but in any case, he made it clear to me that uh, from, from, uh, from his perspective and the perspective of the folks with whom he had spoken, that we needed to further examine the feedback from the public hearing in terms of the next steps, uh, which should include reaching out to stakeholders through groups such as the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, Refugee Resettlement Vermont and Migrant Justice, um, that those folks in those groups could guide us as to the format for gathering recommendations and related need for translators, which languages, um, which documents would be uh, translated. Did we need the translators uh, present uh, during any hearings or work sessions? Um, in addition to providing translation work on documents beforehand and so on and so forth. In other words, mm -hmm. um, issues which got to the um, observation which was made back at the beginning with regard to our very first press release with regard to the, the public hearing, we were thinking that we didn't have this in multiple languages and like that. Okay, so. So those were issues brought up and my God, 
we're supposed to be able to read that. Um, so that's up there. I don't know. Can we zoom, zoom to get to just the content of the email? Um, I can read it out loud also. I've got my iPad here. Sure. Let me just read. No. That is, okay. I, I'm sorry. For, for those watching, there you go. Oh, right, but I'll, still, yeah. I'll still read here. But that's, that's more doable. Yeah. Um, this is from Drew. Um, I am supporting a process to engage community stakeholders to imagine sets of indicators that would better reflect our sense of what should be measured to help understand how Vermont is doing to achieve equitable outcomes. We want help understanding what indicators will better help illuminate disparities in outcomes and disproportionate interactions with state systems. It's funded through the CDC Health Equity Grant. Oh, this is new. This is new information. Um, it could be funded. It is funded through the CDC Health Equity Grant, and I believe can accomplish our needs to build an equity dashboard, CRF funded, CRF being the coronavirus uh, relief fund money, um, as well as to accomplish Act 166 requirements in a way that is inclusive and comprehensive. The data will be disaggregated by geography and produced in the community profiles. It can be leveraged for Act 186 reporting ongoing. It will be published via the power, is that B1 or BI? BI dashboard tool. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> So Power BI stands for Power Business Intelligence. It's one of the data visualization tools in our Microsoft suite. Okay. Yep. So. so. Okay. Well, thank you. So um, that takes care of uh, Drew's section as well, I think. Um, and you just sort of walked through the other made up when yeah. you, you kind yeah. of combine them um, review and discussion of concerns raised. Um, I don't know, I think it's up to the administration sort of to figure out this translation issue. Um, I don't profess any very good knowledge about how to do that. Sure. Have we been translating all the broadcasts we've been doing now? No. So not to my know. So we, so when, so when the um, so when the public hearing was announced, there was feedback that it was not translated, and we received that feedback, and we were given suggestions on what to do. But have we been given feedback besides doing a American Sign Language? We have not been translating our broadcast that or anything we do, and we have not been given feedback about that. Yeah, again, I, I, I think there's a difference between what the administration is doing statewide in terms of translation services and what this little committee could do. Um, I, I don't know what the eight of us would be able to accomplish to try to get that done. I, you're the only administration representative here, Justin, so. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what access to translation services looks like. I know in terms of our public meetings like Microsoft Teams, we can actually translate into up to six languages in real time as we're broadcasting Teams meetings. But that's a oh. totally different thing. Yeah. We have a hand up too. Susanna is here. Yes, Susanna. Thank you. Yes. Um, so translation services is a really big part of that. I might have been one of those people who said, hey, why didn't we translate? Um, and there's Yes, there's what we're working on um, in the admin, which has, I admit, been much slower than I had hoped um, because of a lot of intervening factors in the last year and a half. But there's a lot that we can do just with this committee to ensure better language access. So for example, um, just like Justin mentioned, when you do things on Teams, there is the option for translation, uh, real-time translation, and also sort of retroactive if you're doing recording into multiple languages. I have looked at that language list. Several of the ones that are on the team's translation list do overlap with Vermont's 10 most commonly spoken languages. Not all of them, but a number of them. Um, Zoom also does have the ability to have subtitles in other languages. I have also been on 
number of calls where we have had breakout rooms, some with an ASL interpreter, some with a Spanish language or another language interpreter, and that person is relaying the information being said in the so-called main room. Um, and then of course, another really big one is timing. So regardless of what we're doing, um, being able to allow additional time for our process means that we can have things translated because we don't say, oh, there wasn't time for it. So it means building in that additional timing. And there are a couple of organizations that were already mentioned that do help us out with the translations. So for example, when we were doing our weekly guidance on COVID updates over the last year and change, uh, AHS had partnered with AALV and the USCRI, that's the US Resettlement Agency, the Vermont edition of it, um, to do the translation of those guidance memos. And the feedback that we get from those organizations actually is that one of the helpful things is to be able to put things into short videos, like one minute videos that can be disseminated to members of the community. Um, since, some of, since some of Vermont's most common spoken languages are not always written, uh, or if it is, written proficiency may not be high. So those are some of the ideas. I would say perhaps the biggest one is build in the correct timing so that we can adequately plan for this. And in terms of actually doing it, it means we're gonna have to pay for those services. So we have to be thinking about budgeting for that labor. Um, and it means we have to know what are the most commonly spoken languages in the state or if somebody wants to come in person, do we have capacity to allow for translation in that way? So would that be something that we could get your help with? Um, okay. Budget part, you mean? Oh, well, both the budget and also know. the process to get it. And the languages. May I ask a yeah. question? Sure. I heard things maybe a little bit differently, so I want to check. Um, with Drew's update, I feel like what I heard is that her group is doing some work that could actually take the place of what we're trying to achieve. So. I just want to clarify that first, um, if that is correct, because it doesn't seem it's going to be a big investment for us to do the work. And so if Drew's department is doing the work and going to be using some of these tactics we're discussing, can we just support and build on that rather than start our own thing? That's what Drew seems to be suggesting. I mean, may I ask Susanna? Sure. Susanna, you can hear us fine. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so have you and Drew had any conversation about this CDC health equity grant and the work that's going to be done through that? So do, do you have thoughts as to whether, yeah. are, are you on the same page with Drew about um, that potentially being uh, a mechanism for us to use to accomplish our needs? I have been in conversation with Drew and with others working on that CDC grant. Uh, just as a bit of background, what she mentioned in the update, the CRF funded equity dashboard, that was one project that the legislature was gracious enough to approve for us to create. That was during the rollout of CRF funding. Um, and the CDC grant came in and it seemed like there was substantial overlap. And so what we're trying to do now is streamline it so that A, we don't have a million dashboards for the public to have to sift through and B, so that we don't give the community exhaustion just from parallel engagement processes that all appear to be doing the same thing. Um, and C, just making sure that we're making the best use of our resources, technical, financial, and otherwise. So we're trying to find a way to marry the aims of that CRF equity dashboard and the CDC funded grant in a way that, um, you know, we, we end up with as close to one unified thing as possible. So yes, we are working on that. Now, is that process going to be able to replace what you all are doing? I don't know. And I'm not even sure if I'm the right person to speculate about it. I, I might, if I'm just thinking off you know, top of the dome here, um, I think that even if it could replace it, there is some value to the legislature working on this because you all have the power to codify things into statutes. Um, that AHS and AOA may not necessarily be able to do through our engagement processes. So, and I'm not even sure if that's 100% relevant here. I'm just thinking out loud, but um, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that maybe that process could supplant this one, but it is a great question. And I think that maybe we could explore that. Okay. 
Um, can I ask a question then too? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about interpreting services for just this Act 166 piece or are we talking about it for everything that's we do? I'm, that's what I'm asking. The, the original, if I understood correctly, the original conversation going back to February 22nd, that, that GAC meeting, yeah. it was in terms of our our project coming from Act 166. Right. Okay. Not, Not everything, everything we do as GAC. But is it everything that we do as a legislative body? Because so from my background, I work at the hospital and everything I do at any point in time can be translated for anybody that wants to be there. Uh, we have translators come in physically because as uh, Ms. Davis said, uh, you know, there's are some languages that when you're speaking or they don't they don't translate to written and if they do then some people just it's better to have somebody a, a, someone a vocal opportunity for translation so are we doing this to translate one project we're doing or are we trying to do this to have everything we do at any time can be translated if someone is to walk into this room and wants to know what i'm doing that would be a decision we have to make i think mm -hmm. i heard was that it was for that project on collecting feedback on the indicators around are we addressing the needs of BIPOC Vermonters did it sounds like there were some uh, gaps in that process for whatever the reasons are and that this was should we do a take two to better gather that data that was the conversation on February 27th yeah. I think if I'm hearing correctly yeah. or Representative LaFave pardon me let's what you're bringing up here is that beyond the Act 166 um, requirements, that it's an issue that I understand it's a bigger hole we're opening. But if we're yeah, next. yeah, if we're if people are upset um, as they should be if they are not being translated opportunity, and we are hearing that feedback then are they also not being translated what their government is doing for them? You mean, exactly. when, you mean when the whole legislature is meeting? You mean- Yeah, I mean- if, It's on the floor. If we weren't, that? if they weren't given the ample opportunity and translation to be able to give me feedback on how I can address them better and work for them better, I work for them. Yeah. So if they are not being given the ample opportunity and time and resources to know what I am doing for one project, why is that not making everybody upset that we're not doing that Overall, overall, every single day, if we're going to put all this into translating one thing, then isn't shouldn't the I mean, I know many programs that translate things in time, mm -hmm. you know, would that be a better investment for us to do? Um, sorry, Ms. Davis, I see your hand is raised. Oh, I, I didn't want to interrupt your thought. But I mean, to me, to me, like there's already there's already very large interest. Uh, I don't know how would we want to call you VM companies industries in Vermont that do this every single day no matter what someone needs we translate for them like real time I'm giving someone's firstborn baby a bath I translated my work in real time to them um, and so if we already have something that we know is available why don't we you know we know teams does it teams might not be the most safest uh, way for us to communicate as legislators uh, infrastructure wise but if zoom like if there's things that we know like why are we not just making why are we putting all of our work into one project and not just do it so that way there's not this problem again because i would i'd feel really bad if in a month of us into working something comes up and we're then told again um by the people that we ask for feedback from like again we let them down like i'm sick of hearing that we let people down um if we know about it why are we putting all of our effort into fix it once and not just fix it for good? So we don't have to come back again and again and again and be told we let somebody down again and again and again. So, so am I hearing, mm -hmm. tell me if I'm hearing correctly, that we should be looking at not necessarily we GAC, though maybe GAC could be a driving force if this were. That's what we're here to do. We've got to wrap our heads around here. Um, every committee meeting is in real time translated into X, Y, or Z available the, and what goes on on the floor in both chambers. The best we can translated do. Translated in real time in whatever languages. The best we can, the best we can do. I mean, I don't, I don't understand because if, if someone was to run for, to be a representative, 
and they put, they needed sign language. They, you know, that's their, they, they spoke sign language. Wouldn't we have interpreters through? If somebody runs, you know, to, to be a representative or to be a senator and English is not their first language, aren't we gonna make, I mean, accommodation, <laughs> that's, that's what we do. And if this committee is, or this, if we are charged with making sure that we are being accountable, why are we putting all of our efforts into one project? Because we were told we didn't do it right. I hear you. I don't wanna come back to this again and again, just make it right. I mean, I understand that's something we can't just in a flash of a switch do, but if we're gonna put the efforts into making sure that we are getting feedback in an accountable way, then why aren't we getting information out in an accountable way every single day we're here working? We work for them. We work for everybody. So they should know what we're doing. Yeah, this was something that I, I've been to public hearings before with other committees and none of, none of this ever came up. So this was the first time that it was brought to my attention. But I think you raise a good issue. If, uh, I think the scope is much greater. Absolutely. If, if we're talking about every committee meeting and all the floor activity, um, I don't know what that would cost. I have no idea. But, but it's just time before we're told again um, yeah. and, and, and so be it that something happened. It wasn't translated. There wasn't adequate, you know, the timing, the timing piece, I'm really looking for Ms. Davis to give us some information on like, what does timing look like? Cause that's something that I'm not familiar with and is, nor the pricing, but I do know there are programs where there are turf, you know, they, that they, that's what, that's what they do. Um, and what sparked this whole issue, I, I believe personally in the first place with us was because our efforts were to reach out to marginalized communities, right. folks that um, not necessarily other entities within state government have in doing their particular tasks were really focused on trying to reach out to um, folks that we know from the get-go um, do not have English as a spoken English as a first language. Yeah, I just yeah. think it's a shame to come back to something again and again, because in government operations, we had two public hearings. Um, did, did we not get our information out correctly? Did we, did, you know, did we not have enough people come in from our, I mean, our hearings were packed, you know, but did we not get it out? So like, again, if we're asking, I understand this, this specific charge was to go to places where English probably was not the first uh, language. Mm -hmm. um, Right, good point. Well, even like in Senate Ag, we have testimony all the time from migrant justice folks and they speak English when they come in and it seems as though there, there isn't any issue about them getting to their group with concerns. So again, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily the province of just the GAC committee to figure a way to do this. It seems like it falls on the administration to, uh, to help us out in terms of, uh, how we how we go about doing it why that goes i don't know uh, uh, but to, for us to put the effort in to come back and do this again this isn't going to be the first this is going to be the last time that we were reminded that we didn't do it right i wonder if it's an and piece because i and. would it would be hard if we um let that be not i don't want to say a distraction but like we focused our attention on this wider scope much bigger issue which we need to address and at the same time, we're not able to create momentum on this. No, absolutely. No, I agree. Because, I mean, the administration has been doing press releases. It was three times a week. I don't know how, I think he does them not two times a week now. Once, I don't know how often. Definitely. But, I mean, those must be translated somehow. Yes, we have sign language. Um, right. But those must hopefully have been translated out. Um, I don't so, know. So an and. I so think an, they do have somebody translating. It certainly looks that way when you watch them. They have, they have sign language. Sign. Sign language. But there has to be and more, right? Like we have, so if we, so we are, we're getting the feedback. We we didn't do it correctly. And I would fully support doing it the right way. Um, but, and the and is a very good point, uh, Representative Dolan. And, and um, moving forward, how do we not mess up again? Another and in addition to the administration, the leadership of the yeah. two chambers mm -hmm. would absolutely need to be absolutely. involved in yeah. any right. conversation. Right. Yeah, on the yeah if it involves money. I think, too, wasn't there also a second reason that um, we didn't have as much 
um, participation, which was, we thought was maybe compensating those for coming because some people needed babysitter, you know, there's that whole piece of making sure that people's time I don't was, remember that. I thought that that was part of... That I know was on something that. else, I think. The, oh, okay. Maybe with that the was. per diem that went up to 100 bucks. Well, not for us. I thought it was for the people. No, it, it was for the people that would... participate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm sorry that I sort of jumped in and not let Suzanne... Yeah, I mean, if that was an issue, I never heard about it. Okay, maybe she would now. <laughs> Susanna is the soul of patience. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, so I've been, I have to pat myself on the back for successfully suppressing all of my outbursts for the last three minutes, because I feel very, very strongly that it is an and, it is a yes and, that uh, language access needs to be in place for this process, and it absolutely must be in place in all of the dealings of the legislature and the executive and the judiciary in all things. That is absolutely a goal. And again, this work, we kind of got it started in 2019, had to sort of put it down halfway. But just to spoil the ending of this movie for you, I am going to come to you and say, okay, it's time to really do this now. Um, so that's an end goal for us anyway. It, I think it's excellent that this committee is, is talking about it right now because it's something that I think the legislature needs to be doing at all times. It's you all are the branch of government that has the most opportunity for the public to help determine its own future and to help shape its own future. And as such, the public has to be able to talk to you and hear from you. So what now does that look like? We talked a little bit about the technological resources we have available to us, like the virtual meeting spaces that allow for subtitles and recordings and translations. Um, what does that mean for in-person meetings? Well, it's it's tricky. Vermont's most commonly spoken languages are not necessarily the United States' most commonly spoken languages. So whereas in a major metropolis, it might be easy to say, oh, we'll do Polish, Russian, Italian, et cetera. Um, in Vermont, we have a different set of languages. And because of that, we have a smaller pool from which to pull when it comes to interpreters and translators. Um, so that's one, one consideration if you have a more limited cross-section. By the way, a lot of these folks are also members of our refugee community, and a lot of members of our refugee community often move out of Vermont due to things like lack of opportunity, lack of support, et cetera. So we have a bit of a challenge, and if we want to be able to keep interpreters and translators and the community they serve, it also means that we've got to make sure that we're retaining the community, right, the bigger demographics issue. The other thing that was mentioned a little bit ago was the question of whether this applied to this process or bigger processes or were we compensating people for that hearing or is that a bigger issue um, or I didn't hear this come up for this particular meeting. And the truth is if it's coming up for any of our meetings, it should be addressed at all of our meetings. Um, you know, I know it was mentioned that the folks at Migrant Justice appear to have found a working system for them to be able to engage their limited English proficient members but that really is a workaround to provide a level of access that we as government have to be providing. So um, I'm grateful to them and to other organizations for figuring it out for themselves and for the public. But what we really have to do is um, work with them and compensate them fairly for that working with them um, to make sure that we can take the reins of that access ourselves and, and be able to provide it proactively. I'm gonna stop talking for now, but I just, again, wanna really, really strongly agree with the idea that language access should be a big part of this process, but must especially be part of all of our work. And it is gonna take a significant investment because if we really care about it, we'll prove it by paying for it. Thank you, Susan. Um, well, we're scheduled to take a break at noon or we can work through, doesn't matter. I, I'm not aware that anything's open upstairs to eat. No. No? Can't we just work through? <laughs> can we take a 15 minute break though for personal for reasons? For moving, for moving. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, recess here until, how about 12? 
So what technologically happens when, when, when we were all remote, things stayed live, but we closed off. I can say live, and I'll shut the video and uh, mute the room. And okay. Yeah. They won't be able to. Is there a slide you can put up that just says the committee's taking a break? Um, I may be able to. Let me see what I can do.
<laughs> Thank you, Representative <laughs> Dolan, for turning the microphone back on. He looked great yellow now. Okay, 1220, <laughs> and we're back uh, meeting the Government Accountability Committee meeting of the 2nd of August. And um, so two items remain on the agenda. Well, actually three, but I'm not sure they'll be particularly lengthy. Um, steps moving forward. It's obvious that we need to have another meeting. Um, I'll lean on Amarin if I could for just a couple of minutes for some of the things that we might have mentioned that we probably want to talk about um, in our next meeting. One of them I'm pretty sure is training, right? Yes, there was training about the dashboard. Um, it sounded like you were looking also for some clarification maybe from Drew about the uh, CDC Health Quality Project that they're doing and how that might interact with the work that this committee is doing. Good point. So we'll, I'll put that on my agenda to make sure that Drew attends our next meeting. I also have an action item about getting a cost estimate on the genuine progress indicator. Yes. So I'll follow up on that. Uh, yes. The GPI. Now, Drew's was a potential overlap, I'll just say for the C C CDC grant. And there's the other thing that's going on to the CRF equity dashboard. Yep. Yes, the equity that we've had in legislation. Um, Zuzana mentioned it. Uh, let me get that. Drew's. I'm mistaken. Oh, no, that's right. Here we go. It's um, yeah, the health equity grant. Now, that's the CDC. The equity dashboard, that's what we had in the, um, in the, the bill um, that was funded with some fed, federal mm -hmm. coronavirus money. I remember the, I can't come up with the number of the bill, but I remember when we did that. May I ask a question? Sure. I don't know if this has been confirmed or not. So um, at the February, I think you said 20th, 22nd meeting, there were recommendations that came out for uh, indicators. Are those official? Are those set? Is there anything we need to do on that piece? Uh, I'm trying to recall from what I'm remembering, we sort of tabled it, I guess is the best way yeah. to put it. Um, the group, which actually Jessica was part of too, was Coach, you, Emily, and Drew, I think. Were those the four? And Susanna. And Susanna. And Susanna. Okay. Susanna. Um, what happened in the, uh, the workshop, as I recall, at least, and I was in only one group of it, it, it's different for the eight of us to sort of sit and say, okay, here are the indicators, here are the outcomes. But the general public really has no idea what you're talking about. So the recommendations were sort of like, well, uh, judiciary should do a better job doing this in terms of actual practices or program sort of things. And that really isn't what we're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about indicators and outcomes. So it was sort of hard to educate people quickly enough so that any of the sort of recommendations became valuable. Uh, I'm perhaps overstating that a little bit, but it's we're in a structure of, of sorts with this committee. And if it doesn't sort of plug into a indicator or an outcome, it it really isn't particularly useful. Just to complain about government services wasn't the idea of what we wanted to do. Not that that's not important, but so it was sort of wild swings of recommendations. So I think in the end we didn't really do anything. Um, Suzanne, I think, um, or uh, Sue Zeller did a report in though, because that was what was due. You could help me with that, just yeah, yeah, March 1st. Yeah, March 1st. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was this. Yeah, which is basically the recommendations on which indicators to disaggregate. So of the current ones. Okay, so we did do some of that. And it would be helpful, I think, if everybody could have, you have an email with that in it? Yeah, I can. I'll send, can it send it to yep. everybody so that everybody's going to have that. And Drew is sending everything she's got so that everybody. The other piece that led to those indicators, what I'm just sort of being tabled, that whole language outreach piece. Mm -hmm. That's when it, it veered off into, well, I've got to find out how much this is going to cost and 
Okay. That, you know. So, but the indicators haven't, did I hear they were not changing for this September. So are there any indicator, when are the next indicator changes set to happen? Whenever we decide. Okay, and that decision hasn't been made yet. So we're in this holding pattern right I now. I think the recommendation in here, there were a number of indicators recommended, both ones to disaggregate, ones to add, but there's also a section that basically said this should be considered for the next round. Okay, so nothing is going to be changed for this September 30th. Okay. And Hopefully we, not. That, that would be really difficult to try to make it right now. <laughs> we, the thing that we really worry about is outcomes because that has to go through legislation. And that we do have and we will be spending more time okay. on probably. As yes, S95 still lives. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking as a um, future agenda item. So it seems like getting an update on the indicators or for us to figure out what we want to do for indicators if there's any other follow-up well see that's part of this whole outreach that the what yeah. we want to do about the indicators do are we going to do another public hearing are we going to do another workshop how are we going to do that if we do etc cetera, etc cetera. okay all the language questions and who we reach out to the so, groups so i'm going to put that down as stakeholder interaction question mark um and then decisions on indicators. I think at the next meeting, we have to get some structure. All right, we've ended up, I don't think through, not because there's anything wrong with us. <laughs> So, um, but things have been pretty amorphous. We, we've got to start fishing or cutting bait kind of thing. Yeah. As far as some decisions as to here's what we're going to do and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and Zuzana did say, or did I imagine she said that she could provide some assistance to us with regard to timeline and that. Yeah. yeah, she was. Did she tech. say that, or did I imagine? Yeah, yeah. 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 sum up. Oh, okay. Thank you, Susanna. It wasn't wishful thinking on my part. Okay. So that would go in, in <laughs> under the uh, stakeholder interaction, right? <coughs> in other words, if we have another, whatever we want to call it, public hearing, community meeting, whatever, we need to know how far ahead to yep. let people know. And 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 the time frame within which, if we're dealing with multiple languages, the time it takes mm -hmm. for the work around that to occur before yeah. we actually have people live and in person, whether it's really in person or technologically in person. Have both of you had a chance to at least look at the the dashboard to see what the indicators are? It isn't the dashboard; it's our it's on the committee page, actually. So, in other words, I so did one of the one of the meetings we had. I was in one of the breakout groups. Oh, okay. Um, and I so I didn't get to work with the whole list, but I worked very, very in detail with one. It was the uh, education and how it was. It was one one section that we had the breakout groups, and I was in one of them. Okay. And for like a whole, I don't know, it was an hour more than that. We broke out and we came back. Yeah. So I, okay. I did. I do. And, and Drew did say she was going to send out to all of us the materials from that. I did hear that, right? Mm -hmm, didn't mm -hmm. I? Yeah, okay. Because part of what we used, I mean, there was the full listing. Um, and I think all of us have, if you look back to, if you still have in your email from Drew, the day that morning of the 28th, was it? No, that's the wrong date. The hearing was the twenty. The workshop was the twentieth, right? Um, she sent out that morning, the twentieth, this uh, a series of four uh, attachments, and one of them has right. a gazillion indicators right. for each of the outcomes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's that mo that morning from Drew for four attachments. So what? And, and that brings up a point, and I think Justin could probably comment if it's changed. But since I've been on this committee. We have been encouraged to limit 
the number of indicators mm -hmm. and you can talk about an arbitrary number of six or seven or whatever, because if you begin to get more than that, it just becomes overwhelming and you're just buried in data and there, you can't figure out <laughs> whether there's been any progress made or not. So the outcomes are, are easy. There's, there's going to be, if S95 goes through, there'll only be nine. And then under that will be minimum of probably three indicators for a particular outcome. Some of them probably have seven or eight. I'm not gonna say they don't. I think the Vermonters or the, uh, uh, the economy one um, has probably seven or eight because how do you measure whether Vermont has a prosperous economy? Well, how many people are working? How much they make? that kind of thing, those will be indicators underneath that. So just for people's benefit, when we do take a look at making decisions on changing indicators, it, it isn't necessarily, oh yeah, let's add that one, let's add that one, let's add that one. Because again, at, at some point you'll have a list of 20 or 25 and, and it's just impossible to do anything with them. Has that sort of philosophy changed since Susan? Susan no, 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 five to seven so, is usually. That's where you want to be. Five to seven. Okay. Yeah. So that's important, I think, to at least think about. Because again, they have to have those three. And thank you to uh, Drew for that. Communication power, proxy power, and data power. Mm -hmm. Those all have to be part of that. You have to take into account how expensive it's going to be to, to collect that data. You know, is there a national group that, that breaks down state by state? That would be nice because then we wouldn't be spending any money. Well, we would be out of our left pocket instead of our right pocket because it's federal money, but um, Vermont wouldn't have to spend any extra money to figure out that particular indicator. So anyway, so I have those five items, training, Drew's interaction and potential overlap, with those two grants, cost estimate for the GPI, stakeholder interaction and timeline and decisions on indicators. Uh, that'll keep us pretty busy, I would imagine. Along with the GPI one, besides the, the whole business about the cost, as to whether or not we want to ask for mm -hmm. anything to be done right. in that regard. Yeah, I don't know whether we can, we're not a money committee, so we can't no. authorize expenditures. No, but we can but go asking if there's money, such as I did with subsequent the, to the yeah. 22nd. Okay. So ask about, what would you say, Justin, reinvigorating it or? <laughs> I think just rerunning the report, rerunning. And would that be here? Would we want to hear any testimony on using it if it's necessary? I yeah. Are there committee chairs that would let us know? Or I don't know who. <laughs> we have that one person that emailed us, but I would be curious um, yep. if yeah. what the interest is in it. I can, I can volunteer. Or if somebody else wants to do it, I'm not trying to hog all the you know the tasks here but i'm willing to send a piece out to um is the senate up for hearing i could send it on behalf of both of us because mm -hmm. i don't want the senate upset if they're receiving something from a house member um we look fond of london I would check as i do before sending it but to, to send out uh, an, an inquiry to the chairs of the committees in both chambers, um, with our with the leadership of both chambers copied, mm -hmm. so that they're aware we're communicating yeah. because we don't want to step on anybody's toes um, to ask about use of the genuine progress indicator and the value that they place upon it in doing committee work. That's a good Is idea. That, yeah, I would indicate it hasn't been done since, yeah. would you say 19, 18? Yeah. There is a cost involved. Yeah. And if they're not going to use it, what's the point of rerunning the report? It exists in statute, right? Yeah, it does exist. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I think there was a statutory reference to it. Yeah. I don't know if there's a limitation on time frame. Well, we just need to check what's in. I, I, I can do that. Okay. I'll, I'll check statute. Again, I think the number can be run, according to Ken, 15 to 20 hours to just run the calculation to get the number. But the analysis that's involved yeah. in the reporting, that's, 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 that's the other piece. So what about joint fiscal? Maybe it's worth just asking them if they use it. Yeah. Oh, ask the standing committees as well as joint fiscal. That's yeah. 
Okay, so those are five items for the next meeting. And other. We gotta yeah. put other. Sure. Oh, the, um, Senator White had a thought. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She wants to talk about um, possible, uh, not expansion, but a, sort of a re definition of some of the things that we're responsible for. I'm not saying that particularly good way, but I didn't want to bring it up today because I wanted her to be here in person to, mm -hmm. to share her thoughts. So I'll just put Senator White's idea. Okay. Um, I guess we could do it one of two ways. Um, we can do a doodle poll for uh, the next meeting. I don't know what August looks like for most people, but all of a sudden comes September and it'll be here before you know it kind of thing. So why don't we try uh, Mariah for, just take the whole month of August and see what dates might be available for people. Well, that's a wide net, but I got a feeling that I'm already, you know, probably five or six of them are out for me, but you know, again, the start time would be 10 and you kind of defaulted to two. I, I don't think we'll go to two. Did you want to start uh, next month on Monday? That'd be great. Yeah, a week from today. Perfect. Yeah. A week from today. Well, we we don't want to be meeting till I've till we've communicated with um, right. Don't we want to have True. feedback yeah. from the standing committees and JFO? And I I, I don't know that every member of the legislature is sitting attached to yeah. respective emails. Well, I don't think it's done on the 23rd. Not everybody's like you and I. So should we say uh, Jessica's point is the 23rd, which is a Monday, and then the following week is the 30th. Well, that goes into Labor Day weekend, but that's okay too. I mean. Maybe like mid-August starts. to mid-September. There you go. Yeah, that's fine. And that gets the meeting again before the magic date of September 30. Yeah. I don't know that that's going to make a particle of difference about anything in this world, but at least, you know, there's something sensible about that. And I'll include um, Susanna and Coach and um, Drew, or you could if you want, Mariah, uh, and certainly Justin. I, don't, I think those were the four. Oh, and Amarin. Mm -hmm. And Mariah herself. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't do this without her. Um, the last item I'll just ask about the status of co-chairs. Um, I had sort of had this thing fall in my lap three or four sessions ago. When I first came on this committee, Diane Snelling was still uh, in the Senate. In the Senate, and yeah. she was the chair of the committee. And I sort of did it at her request to even join the committee. And we had, I bet, half a dozen senators cycle through this committee and stay for a little bit and all of a sudden they're gone and somebody else comes in. And that's fine, that's the way things go anyway. Anyway, um, I don't have a burning desire to stay as a co-chair. But if no one else is jumping up and down to do it, I'll certainly uh, serve the rest of this coming year because the biennium would end and there'd be a new. That changes things anyway. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I can't speak for my co chair, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I'm willing to hang in with Senator Collimore um, if no other House member is wanting to take over as co-chair, but then that's, you know, the end of the biennium is the mm -hmm. end of the biennium. Well, you have the other ones here. I don't, I don't have the advantage of any other, I don't have any of the other senators here, so I don't see any senators' hands up. They can be like, oh, we didn't hear you, we didn't know. And the two senators are brand new to the committee. Senator Ron and, and oh, no, Senator Perchlick. 
And Senator White. Senator well, White. She's not new to the committee. She was no. chair at one time, wasn't she? No. No. She was insisting she wasn't. Okay. No, she wasn't. She never was. Hmm. No. I think it's I been you and I for six years. Oh, well, yeah, since I've been here. So this is your sixth year. So she appears at the top of the list of senators, but <laughs> just because we really like her. No, I see that. It's not alphabetical or anything. No, that's all right. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. Once you guys were no longer the chairs, you guys are on top currently. So once oh. you have the chair co chair again, they should appear on the very top of the list. Then. Yes. I, don't, I don't really care one way or another because actually, it's I just assume we have nobody, you know, oh, it must be white we get a hold of. Let's get a hold of Senator White. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So it's up to House members. What? I think it's great if you guys were in the middle of a session, let's hang in there and get through this next year. And I'm appreciative of you all being willing to do that. Be active supporters to make your role as successful yeah. and we're pleasant as possible. Call me what you need. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, seeing no uh, other interest, I guess we better take a formal vote. So. Yeah, and then Mariah can put us back at the top of the list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all those in favor of retaining. Because you'll recall at the last meeting, you and I basically said you weren't going to do it. <laughs> Remember, so. I know. I thought, oh, God. Is anybody else going to want any of this? You were so nice to me earlier. I'm like, she must be asking me. Oh, no. <laughs> when have I not been nice to you? Right now, I'm going to. So, all those in favor of retaining Senators Collimore, Senator Collimore, and Representative Townsend as a co chair, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And we do have a quorum, and they're all, and you are here, so you can yeah. vote. And, uh, and it's legit. No, it's in the records. Okay. Is there any other business to come before Thank us you. today? Thank you. We'll definitely be taking you up on the on the support. I'm here. I know what you need. Okay, so uh, I'll consider this. Mariah's trying to ask something. Sorry. So you were ending it. My apologies. <laughs> do you do we want Mariah to end the live component oh, here? Yeah, well, we'll just adjourn so that.